We are connected to the cloud server and I'm going to go ahead and get started. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. It has Good morning, been a Kathy. week. It has been a week. Uh, welcome to Botanical Colors Feedback Friday. Uh, this is our eighth episode of being online and live on Friday Fridays. Sometimes, mostly it's in the morning, sometimes it's at a different time to accommodate the speaker. Um, where we speak with dyers, artists, scientists, and scholars about our favorite topic, which is natural dyes. Um, today, we are going to be, um, oh wait, I ran ahead of my script here. Uh, so <laughs> let me introduce myself. I'm Kathy, um, Amy Dufo, and Carrie Gunnerson. Uh, Amy's our Director of Social Media and Sustainability, and Carrie is uh, our lead production dyer. We are going to talk about uh, scouring and mordantine. Uh, our company is based in Seattle, Washington, and we have um, both an online um, sales program that you have all so generously do donated to. <laughs> Thank you. As well as we do a lot of custom production dyeing in Seattle and around the world. Um, we're going to walk you through with scouring and mordantine the hows and whys of preparing your fibers for the dye bath and why this is such a key step. And once you understand these basics, you're going to be able to bend the rules a bit, but I think understanding the fundamentals is really, really uh, important and useful for you. And before we start, I just want to send out another huge, huge thank you to everybody who joins our Feedback Fridays and also has helped uh, been supportive of us by ordering online. We could not do this without you. Absolutely. Um, it's just such a crazy time and being able to uh, make sure that we're still ticking with uh, online orders has been just incredibly gratifying and, and thank you for that. We can't thank you enough, really. Um, just for a little bit of housekeeping to keep going here, um, Amy is our moderator. Amy, you want to just say hello so people can see you? Hello, I am Amy, your moderator. There we go. Um, <laughs> she's going to monitor the chat on this call. If you're familiar with Zoom, there's a chat function. If you're not, if you look down at the black bar on the bottom of your screen, there's something that says chat. And we, um, we have silenced the chat until later. Right. So right. we okay. got so many questions already just mailed into us that we're going to answer those first. And then if there are additional answer uh, questions after the chat, then we will um, open it up and have at it. I mean, we, we are here to answer your questions. Um, and then also everyone will stay muted for the presentation, but at the end we'll open up um, the and unmute everyone so we can all say hi. Um, if you wanna see everybody on the, the call, switch to gallery view. Me, because I get a little bit nervous, I keep it in speaker view so I can only see about five people and that's all I think I'm talking to. And that helps me a lot. Um, we have this call being recorded. And so there'll be a link to the video of this um, after, it usually takes, what, about a half a day or even the next day before we get it all together. I am so ready for these guys now. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> We'll Within two to hours it. tops, you're going to have this. Oh, yeah. She's bragging now. She's bragging. Um, yeah. She doesn't have the uh, attendee list yet. But wait till we show images later. You'll see I am not yeah. on. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Good. Um, joining me today is Carrie Gunnerson. She's running our Botanical Colors production. Um, she's been extremely inventive and has been doing all the color development for our, our production projects that are uh, we're working on at home. Um, she's also doing a little cut and sew for us and just about anything else we can do to um, kind of keep ourselves busy and, and uh, keep moving. Carrie's the one who knows a lot about scouring and mordantine because she runs everything that we do in our production and uh, we'll cover how to prepare plant fibers. So we call plant fibers cellulose. So if you hear us say talk about cellulose or protein, Cellulose are plant fibers, protein are animal fibers, and silks. So um, it's, it's kind of embedded in our vocabulary. Uh, that's just what we're talking about, just to clarify for you. Um, and so I'm going to be talking about how to mordant the animal fibers, and I've chosen silk for today. 
uh, you'll be able to see both a before and after of what's going on with um, our, our fiber choices and our mordant versus non-mordant um, results. Okay, just a couple of reminders. Um, we've actually updated the how to scour and how to mordant how-tos on our website. So uh, I went through them last night. It was a little late, so hopefully there's no kind of like dangling sentences, but we'll, we'll, those are ready for you. Um, we've tried to clarify a little bit and add a little bit more information. Um, many of the resources that either you raise in your questions or we uh, will talk about will also be listed and or linked uh, in the blog post that has the video link in it. So check back to the website under blog and you'll see all of that information there. Okay, um, I'm just going to jump right into this and talk about scout, oops, scouring and mordantine. So I get a lot of questions with people like, I washed it in my washing machine or I washed it by hand. Is that scouring? And kind of the short answer is no, that is not scouring. But it's not a bad step. It's just oftentimes it's not sufficient. So Amy's got a picture of two beakers. And before you show it, Amy, let me just describe it. Um, I was working on a project where we were getting beautiful color and the minute we sent it out for the textile testing uh, was failing. Even the base fabric that had no dye on it was failing. And failing meaning that it shifted color so dramatically upon exposure to light and to being washed that it wasn't considered saleable uh, in a commercial environment. So I had never, I ended up calling probably 30 people saying, have you ever had an undyed fabric fail, you know, testing, and no one had ever even experienced this, so we were really, like, not getting it. So I ended up just trying a different scour, and um, there's two pictures. One is kind of lightly soiled fabric, and the other one is extremely soiled fabric, but the fabrics that I was working for on this project, there were two different fabrics we were using. This is what came out of them after the factory had already done their scour. So Amy, show this picture. So that's a bleached but unscoured fabric. So it had like a hydrogen peroxide bleach on it or an eco bleach. Um, as you can see, it's still kind of not so great. Um, but this is the one that was the natural fabric that came straight from the mill and then had actually already been washed, and then uh, I thought it had been washed, and this is what the picture looks like of that one. So that's just kind of disgusting, right? I mean, that is like so much stuff on your fabric. If you were to try to put a mordant and a dye on top of that, it would really, you wouldn't really get the results that you wanted. And that's why scouring is so important when you are working with fresh from the mill, raw fabric, you're going to need to really scour. If you're working with something like, um, I mean, if you look at your fabric and it's really soft and it's really white and it says it's PFD, which means prepared for dyeing, or RFD, ready for dyeing, uh, then, Amy, you can switch back to me. Um, then what that means is that it's probably pretty clean and you don't really need to do like an all out heavy duty scour. That in that case, the washing machine is probably just fine. But if you have some heavy cotton duck canvas that you're going to make tote bags with and you've decided that you um, are going to paint them with natural dyes or do something beautiful on them, then you want to go all the way through that scour process and clean that stuff up. Canvas heavy fabrics are the ones that I see the most. Um, residue come off of, but also if you are working with like a silk noil or a raw silk, or um, I think this is a silk fabric I have here. It's something. Um, this came from uh, Eastern, um, I'm sorry, East India, Northeast India. Uh, the region is called Assam. And as you can see, it's pretty toothy. It's got a lot of stuff in it. Um, this would definitely have to be scoured. Otherwise, 
what we would see is that you would get the color on it and actually would hold the color pretty well for a time and then it would start to kind of unevenly change now if if there's lots of people who are like okay that's fine that's i'm fine with that okay great i just want you to know um, you get to decide, but I want you to know that if you aren't scouring and cleaning your fabric beforehand, you are going to have results either right at the moment or later down the road that are not going to show that the, the, the color is attached. And so, you know, when people are like bashing natural dyes for not being fast or rubbing off, you can almost always point to either bad dye technique or not so great fiber prep technique, which is scouring. Okay, I think I've beat this into your heads enough. Um, what we're gonna talk about next is mordantine and what, what is mordantine and, and why am I mordantine? But before I move on, Amy, are there any, any questions I can answer that came in about scouring? We have no questions coming in because we're not going to, uh, we're gonna go through our list of questions. Any scour questions I can answer that someone sent in previously? Um, we have the, we have the Mordenton questions and we have, um, yeah, where okay. are all the, yeah. All right. Let's just like go through these. I think they're kind of mixed in a little bit, Kathy. Okay, so. cool. Um, so then the next thing is Mordentine. So Mordentine, what is Mordentine? I mean, I, I have people ask me, can I use vinegar as a Mordent? Um, and you, you, you can't, but we'll talk about that later. Um, so mordants are typically, a, they're a chemical substance, they're from natural sources, but really when you are looking at natural dyeing, this is kind of the technical part of natural dyeing that will help ensure that whatever you're doing after that, you get really great color, you get the best color you can um, from the plant substance that you're using. Because I know a lot of us, myself included, are totally in love after seeing Brees, Honeycutt's pounding stuff, um, pounding paper with flower petals, I mean, I, I like I'm all over that. This is what I want to do. But I understand that if I want to do it on a fabric and if I want to wear it as a piece of clothing, that having a mordant on it is going to increase the longevity of that. Um, maybe not as much as if I used a traditional, very time-worn, uh, and time-tested dye, but it, it's gonna give me a little bit of a leg up and it'll last me more than a week. So all that work I've done won't be for just, you know, one, one week's worth of work. We do not wanna have natural fast fashion, okay? So um, what a mordant is, is a mineral salt typically um, that helps the fiber and the dye bond together. So what's happening chemically is that the fiber, the mordant bonds with it. It's not just sitting on top, it's bonding. And then the natural dye molecules out here in the dye bath and it bonds with the uh, mordant. So it, it forms these, um, I don't wanna say permanent, but very durable bonds that will hold through multiple washings, through exposure, things like that, that will help keep that color on your textile. And when you are doing, when you are working with textiles, you know, usually when you're working with natural dyes, you have this sense of something that you want to be able to enjoy for an extended period of time. Um, so by mordantine and doing a scour process, you are trying to pave the way for the best foundation to put that, that dye on top of. Um, so without a mordant, many natural colors uh, and dyes just perform terribly on fabric. And we are going to show you live results here that both Carrie and I dyed yesterday. Um, it, it's pretty shocking, actually, to see. So if, if you're new to natural dyeing and you've been working without a mordant and you're kind of like, God, you know, these colors, they're not that great. And they don't look anything like what I see on the website. The mordant is a key step that you should try to incorporate. As you get more skilled with natural dyes, you can use different mordant variables, you can use different mordant amounts, you can use different mordant techniques, but just kind of getting the basics down, it's sort of like having a great pie crust recipe, you know, in your arsenal, you can do a lot of stuff. And so that's why we're so 
adamant about at least understanding and learning about mordants um, so that you have a long time. Um, so most of the common, the two common mineral mordants that we use, actually it's one mineral mordant, two variations, um, and that we're going to talk about today are aluminum sulfate and aluminum acetate. Um, both of these are considered non-toxic, but I always say that if you're working with dyes for a long time or working with, uh, in this environment for a long time, you should have at least one of these. Now we had this pre-pandemic, okay? I've used this about 60 times, um, but I'm pretty sure that everybody has one of these now, right? So this is also fine for just measuring powders, um, doing those kinds of things where you don't want to be inhaling dust. Um, it's not good for your lungs. Um, and, you know, if you want to do this with kids, I would say if it's possible for you to do all of your mordantine without children and pets of, around, great. Uh, the other thing with mordantine is, and with, with mordantine specifically is, if you're working in your home kitchen, you want to be able to use pots and utensils that are not used for cooking. So if you can, um, do that. Uh, okay, the only exception to mordant, 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 is, which I've been talking about, is of course indigo. Indigo is actually a different kind of class of dye. So the mordant dyes are the ones we recommend mordantine for. Indigo is considered a vat dye. It does not require a mordant. But if you're gonna combine indigo with something, then you would say indigo, dip, wash your fabric, mordant, and then do your second color. Um, okay, I'm done with my um, Mordant and Scour Sermon. And now I'm going to turn it over to Carrie. And Carrie's going to go through cellulose mordantine, the experiment she ran yesterday, and then it'll return uh, for me to talk about the protein mordants. Okay, Carrie, go for it. Thank you. Hello. So um, with the cellulose fibers that I was working this experiment on, I have two variations of cotton and I have a linen. So I have a cotton gauze, a cotton jersey, and a linen here. And with the mordant variable that Kathy was talking about, I am using aluminum acetate with a calcium carbonate post mordant. And um, we did get some questions about dissolving aluminum acetate. And we took some photographs to try and support my um, explanation of dissolving aluminum acetate. As Kathy said, it's really great and important to just, you know, cover your, your face, your mouth and nose while um, weighing it out, dissolving it and, you know, mixing it because there are, there are powders um, and, you know, always good to protect yourself. So if Amy, if you want to bring up a series of photographs showing me dissolving, dissolving aluminum acetate, they're not, they're not super exciting, <laughs> but, um, you can see in the photo with the um, water being poured into the powder. Um, yeah, go back this one. So you can see that right away, you're not going to get an instant dissolved powder. So I love using some type of whisk um, to really help stir and break up the powders. I use, I, boil water on my stove here when I'm working from home. And so I pour extremely hot water. I love <clears throat> using a vessel that is much larger than you think you would need to use because it's just nice to have that amount of water to dissolve. Um, you can let it sit for an extended period of time as it will eventually naturally dissolve itself. But like I said, the whisk helps just make the process go quicker. And then the, Amy, if you wanna go to the spoon shot, you can see that it does eventually all dissolve. And that is when you wanna add it to your mordant bath, which I mordant in cold water. And Amy, if you wanna to go to the next slide, showing me using a utensil, not necessarily my hands, but if you want to use your hands, I always suggest putting gloves on. 
and you really want to push the fibers underneath the water. I like to agitate and move it around enough so that all those oxygen bubbles are released. You really want to make sure that the fa fabric is underneath the underneath the you know liquid and um, yeah, hanging out without any of those bubbles in there that will eventually lead to an uneven dye job. So the first, um, I used two dyes. Kathy and I agreed on using a matter and a logwood. And Amy, if you want to pull up uh, the slide showing the logwood, I used all three of these materials, the cottons and the linen. I have one set that was unmordanted and one set that was mordanted with this aluminum acetate and calcium carbonate mordant. And you're gonna see the drastic results that come from not mordanting and mordanting. So here you can see the, the color variation. I'm almost laughing here. Like it's so drastic. So a lot of people do like getting very muted, uh, dull, very light colors. And, and that's great. As Kathy mentioned earlier, it's your choice. You, you might know what you want as a result. However, as Kathy also mentioned, we're not looking to get the fast fashion into the natural dye world. So if you want these light and muted colors, I, we always suggest mordanting because of the longevity of this dyed piece. However, just use less dye. So all across the board, it'll just be less wasteful. And so, um, yeah, moving on to the matter example, you can see here too, it proves that with the mordant, you are going to get so much more out of the, the color and the amounts that you're using. And when we're talking about amounts here, Amy, it's fine if you leave this slide up um, just so people can really, yeah, uh, register the difference of using a mordant and not. But with the amounts, some people, especially if you're working from home and not going into work, we might not have scales. And um, that's fine. I just wanted to kind of address that really quick so we can have the comparison of, you know, I work with percentages especially in a production you know, setting, we wanna get the same results every single time while working with the clients. However, like I said, if you don't have a scale at home, I used, um, I was dyeing the four pieces of fabric that are all about the same size of a, a piece of like printer paper. And with those four pieces, it was about 150 grams. So for this example with the matter, this is a 5% matter based on the weight of the fibers of the four pieces, the size of the sheet of paper. And then with the logwood, Amy, if you want to go back to the logwood slide, this is the result of a 1%. So you can see that we're using such small amounts of dyes and getting these, this gorgeous purple from the logwood while using the mordant. So really you're seeing this drastic, you know, the color is just drastic difference. Um, and so, Carrie, oh, yes, if I could just interject. So absolutely 5% matter is maybe uh, like, yeah, I have that written a down. Teaspoon? Was it about a so, teaspoon? Yeah. The 5% matter for this amount, the 150 grams for the mm -hmm. four pieces of fabric was about one spoonful or like a, mm -hmm. a teaspoon. Mm -hmm. And then with the 1% logwood, that was about, you know, a quarter, a quarter spoonful. Right. So, tiny um, amounts. Thank tiny you. amounts. So if you just want to use that 5% weight of fiber for the 150 grams, you can just, you know, use that one spoonful. And then if you go to the 1%, you know, it's, it's approximately one fifth or a quarter of that spoonful. So um, that's a really good place to start if you are, if you're new to natural dyeing, if you just have maybe old kitchen utensils that you're using, it's a really good, yeah, a really good place to start. So um, yeah, I think that that about covers the, uh, the, the, you know, continuation of grilling in to our brains, how important mordanting is for this process. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Amy, are there any questions specific to, um, cellulose 
Mordentine that we could answer at this time? Um, I mean, what I, yeah, we definitely have, oh, for the cellulose, I'm sorry, Kathy. Or anything. <laughs> I mean, we can just kick off the questions. Sure. As in order sure. For right now, if you like. Um, so starting from the top, can you use the same mordant bath several times? You absolutely can. Um, we actually have a, we, we'll link to the place on our how to mordant um, website uh, information. And basically we have one customer who is in an area there, they don't have a whole lot of water. So water scarce. And she reuses her mordant bath at least seven times before she finally discards it. Um, by the end, it's a little strange looking. It's probably a little murky. There's probably a lot of little alum floaters in there, but it's still fine. So uh, yes, you absolutely can. And we right. give you instructions. And all these questions that were that I'm asking, asking Kathy and that she's answering, I've already loaded it onto our um, instructions page. So you'll have all the answers already at the ready because I'm on it today, Kathy. Thank you, Amy. Yes. Um, <laughs> can you prep several materials in the same mordant bath, dye one at a time, letting others dry, and dye at a later date? Absolutely. I, we do this all the time because, you know, we're, we're in the process of, because we've had to work from home, we had to kind of prep things. Um, last week, Sasha Durr was speaking about how she wanders the globe, um, gleaning color from different uh, natural plants and substances that she finds. And she just has yardage that she's marked with like, this is silk and it has alum on it. And she just tears off a little swatch and throws it in her dye bath, or maybe she's got a pre-cut. Um, so you absolutely can do this. You can, you can mordant immediately. You can, you can hold your stuff overnight in your mordant bath and mordant the next day. You can store your stuff um, damp for a, a short amount of time and then mordant, or you can dry everything and then uh, mordant uh, much later. What is the best pH neutral soap to use when washing fabrics after the mordanting and dyeing process? You know, we're, um, we typically will use like a seventh generation type. Um, no dyes, no fragrances, laundry soap, laundry detergent. Um, I typically don't get stuff that has extra whitening in it because that means it's going to um, remove the color. So just get a really simple, um, you know, basic, not a very simple soap will, laundry soap will be good. All right. I read that the soy process is more of a modifier than a mordant. What do you think, Kathy? Yeah, I have real strong feelings about this. Um, so soy is not a mordant. Soy is a binder. And the difference between a binder, so I had to, th was trying to think of an, of an analogy um, yesterday. And so like everybody else, I am like baking things all the time. I mean, we are eating dessert every night. We hardly ever have dessert when there's no pandemic. But I was thinking, okay, so let's say you want to cook with chocolate and you want to bake something and you have chocolate chips, but you're going to make a chocolate cake. How do you make chocolate chips with a chocolate cake? So you're going to melt all the chocolate and you're going to put it in the batter and you're going to stir it. And so the chocolate becomes part of the batter. That's mordantine. Okay. That's what mordant does. It becomes part of the fiber. And then when you want to add in anything else, it attaches to that mix of fiber and alum or chocolate and battered uh, cake dough, whatever. Right. So that's kind of what it's like. It's all incorporated. It's there. What soy is, is like if you decide you have a cake and you want to put in chocolate chips and you put the chocolate chips in there and they stick to the batter. They're sitting on top of the batter. It's like a little, you know, remember when you could make those cookies that had that Hershey's kiss on the top? Boom. That's what soy milk's like. It's just glued to there. It's not a mordant. So you can use it pretty successfully if you do... Um, a soy milk wash, and then you do your dye or your paint. It's typically used with pigments. You paint 
and then you cure, you can get some longevity, but it, it's not the same as mordantine. Um, it also changes the hand of the um, fabric because it's basically a plant plastic that's gluing this stuff on. So you'll feel it. Um, some people love it. Some people don't like it. So that's what soy is. Um, your analogy will forever be marked as like, like, like the Kathy Hattori chocolate chip. The chocolate chip um, soy milk. Soy milk. Debacle. Um, <laughs> yes. Do you always mordant even if you're... <laughs> You're using a tannin-rich dye bath? Um, it's kind of a maybe answer, and it's, it's something that we're probably going to need to do for a, a future Feedback Friday, which is the use of tannin and iron or iron and dyeing and what it does. I actually have a... Um, uh, a set of samples from one of our customers and I'm going to contact her and see if maybe she would want to kind of explain what she's done because it's very fascinating. But back to the question. So alum sometimes will alter the color, uh, especially when you're trying to get super dark shades. So Amy's got a slide and I'll just narrate that slide of um, what we did with uh, a customer where we were doing color development and she was trying to get something as close to black as possible. And so were we. Is it here, Amy? Okay, good. Just a moment, Kathy. One moment. One moment, please. I used to be a receptionist. Um, and so that I learned that one moment, please. I'll connect you to that. I was a department store. I'll connect you to my email box that will. That, that is not that. the photo, Emmy. <laughs> yeah, here I go. Okay. No, no. Okay, so here it is. So you should be looking at an image that's got kind of a brownish, purplish um, uh, swatch on one side and then sort of a darker, grayer, we're going to call it blacker um, image. So the the one on the left is. Um, we added alum. So we mordanted the piece. It's a piece of silk. It's a protein fiber. We mordanted it with um, alum and then we added um, tannin and we added iron and we were trying to get to this black and <laughs> we got this kind of brown. And so it, in, in typical, um, I don't want to tell you that the color didn't turn out, but I'm going to pretend like it did. I, when I, so because we can't work together, you know, Carrie and I are working remotely. And so Carrie was saying, oh, yeah, it's it's dark. It's dark. And she had left the drying sample downstairs. And um, so when after she had left, I came down and looked at it and I went, oh, that's not that's not black. <laughs> so then we redid it and we ended up um, adding the um, not using the 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 uh, alum and so as you can see you get a something that's much closer to a black than if you added alum in and so that's a case where the alum and a mordant has actually altered the color to a place where we weren't trying to go um, it was a perfectly nice color but it wasn't what we wanted so um, when we talk about this whole section and chapter we will go into detail of the kind of the hows and the whys of when you use alum, when you're trying to achieve super dark neutrals, such as um, charcoal gray, near blacks, uh, those kind of, uh, even, even some of the dyes that you use that are heavy in tannin, like walnut, um, will express themselves very differently with a mordant and without a mordant. Very different than what you're seeing with um, the logwoods. Okay, I'm ready for the next question, Amy. Oh, okay. Um, great. Let's see here. All right. Um, is it common to use alum with cream of tartar? Um, for wool fibers, that's kind of the, um, one of the things that everybody does is because cream of tartar both helps the alum attach, um, a little more evenly to the wool substrate. And when I say, I'm talking about wool yarn or wool fabric. Um, it will also brighten colors, and in some cases, it, it will inhibit colors. So if you're mordantine with aluminum sulfate and cream of tartar, and you decided to do logwood, you're going to get a very brownish, grayish shade instead of 
a, an actual deep purple. So there are ways to kind of mitigate for that, but I'm not going to go into a ton of detail on it is, but yes, cream of tartar is used almost solely with wool if you're using cream of tartar. You can use it in other dye baths with other fibers in order to make it more acidic or to lower the pH, but you don't typically mordant with it on cellulose, nor do you mordant with it on silk. Okay. Which type of mordant mordanting do you think ensures color fastness? So I think that the best color fastness comes from using a dye that has a good color fast um, potential as well as mordantine. And if you mordant with the typical alum um, or iron, using iron as, as a partial mordant, I mean part of your mordant scheme, um, all of those you would have better light and want wash fastness than you would if you used other substances. Here's like, I think one of the only scouring questions we got. If I use untreated and unbleached fabric, is it a must to scour the fabric or is washing it enough? So the whole wash or scour question is, is the fabric, there's, there's these qualities of fabric that you can purchase. So the raw straight from the mill has had no, no mill washing any or bleaching or anything like that, no matter what, what it is, like eco bleaching or regular bleaching. Um, it's, it's typically things like if you go to, if you buy canvas cotton duck from a canvas company, that is untreated. And that is called grage, which rhymes with beige, or gray goods. Sometimes they call it raw, um, although in it, raw means something different in textile terminology, but sometimes a, a seller will call it that. Um, raw silk, silk noil, all of those have still have a lot of, um, in the case of cellulose or cotton fibers, it will have pectins, it will have waxes, it may have little spots of the cotton bowl in there, um, that kind of speckled look, all of that is stuff. And a lot of that stuff can come off if you scour. And so that's really important. If it's, uh, if it's PFD or RFD, which means prepared for dyeing, or ready for dyeing, then all of those are typically fairly clean. You can also scour those if, you're, if you've got something really special you're working on and you just wanna ensure that it's okay, or you can actually just wash it. And we, Carrie and I have been experimenting with things that come from our customers that are PFD, and we're getting really good results without scouring. So um, we feel like PFD is pretty, pretty clean. But just be aware, is it gray or grayish goods or is it PFD? If it's PFD, you should be okay with washing. Okay, um, my aluminum acetate doesn't completely dissolve even with boiling water. Do you recommend putting the undissolved um, alum acetate in the vat with the fabric or would you strain it out? Um, so I hope that Carrie's little um, photo essay of how she's dissolving aluminum acetate is helpful. Um, not dissolving aluminum acetate could be just that you need to let it sit more. Sometimes if you just, it can be extremely frustrating because it'll get all clumpy on your spoon or your whisk and you can't, you can barely even move it. There's just so much stuff on it. But if you just let it sit for a few hours, it often will just dissolve right off of the spoon, and then you can either continue to dissolve it or it's ready to go. If it's got still a lot of particles in it, um, I would strain it. You don't want to put um, big clumps of aluminum acetate in your um, mordant bucket without having um, them strained out because it's going to make spots on your fabric. All right. I have some cotton and linen t-shirts that have faded over years of wearing and washing. Do I need to remordant before over dyeing them? Especially if I wash them regular, regularly with laundry detergent, you know, I, should, I, should I scour, should I remordant? You know, if something has been laundered by you, home laundered for a number of washes, I don't think you really need to re-scour. 
Um, my experience is that you will get better color if you do a remordant, um, although it is technically not required. I just feel like it just kind of pops the color a little bit better. So if you are able to do it, great. Go ahead and remordant. If you can't remordant, you can go ahead and just try redying it and see what your results are. And that will also inform whether you re remordant the next time you um, over dye again. I recently mordanted some cotton in an alum acetate bath and then did half in a chalk after bath. The swatch from the chalk after bath didn't seem to make a big difference. Do you still recommend to do this? And if so, how long do you recommend leaving the fiber in the chalk um, after the bath? For um, yeah, so the, the reason for either the wheat bran or the chalk bath is that there's a chemical reaction that happens between the aluminum acetate mordant and these two post baths. And um, I don't know the difference between them. I've just been I, I've just been told that they both work and I have I was looking at some emails from 2013 from Michelle Garcia where he was talking about how to use these. Um, but I believe they each have a, a a way of converting the excess aluminum acetate on um, on the fiber so that you get a clearer color. And I really wish I had this swatch from, a, a, I'm sure I have it somewhere, but I just can't find it. I used to not put a post bath on aluminum acetate and I would just get these really wimpy colors, sort of dull, kind of grayish and not really understand why because I was using, I'd been, I started my natural dye career by only dyeing wool. So everything on wool is pretty successful usually. So when I moved to cotton, I just hated dyeing cotton. I despised it. And then I realized it was all on me. It was my mordant technique. So once I started doing uh, the post bath and I've used um, both wheat bran and calcium carbonate and um, the colors were just so much more vibrant and we got better um, wash and light fast results. Uh, with it. So um, you, even though you can't see it, it, the, the durability is better and it's a better chemical setup for your dyeing. So continue to use one of those. So going right into animal fibers, as you're talking about it. So when I use a plant dye on my all natural wool yarn, I fr frequently end up with a duller looking yarn than I started with. The color looks flat and the slight sheen that the yarn had previously is gone. Could it be my mordant? It is your mordant. Um, so here in the Pacific Northwest, our water comes from snowpack. So it's actually quite acidic. It's usually between six and a half and seven. Uh, in other parts of the country where you either have highly mineralized water or um, you know, your water sources are different, you are gonna have both a more neutral to even slightly basic or slightly alkaline water, as well as having mineralized water. When you put alum on an animal fiber, if you have mineralized water, sometimes that reaction can cause your wool to look duller, almost cottony, or it can cause it to feel tacky or sticky. Cream of tartar, is supposed to help this. But if it's not helping, then what you should think about is maybe lowering the amount of alum that you're using from 12% to maybe 10% or even 8% and lower the cream of tartar to about 5%. That should help the hand of the fiber, but kind of experiment with it a little bit to see what's the best um, mix for you. You'll, you'll still get great color on your on your wool yarn, so I wouldn't worry about that, but it will help with that kind of excessive alum feel. How can I keep my wool yarn from blooming when I am scouring or, or mordanting? I have been careful about temperatures. Okay, so this one, I have to tell you, has me stumped. I don't know how to keep wool from blooming once water hits it. I mean, I, I think what you're saying is it gets puffy, and I thought that was like a quality that we wanted in wool, but I, so because I don't have um, a way of answering that, I don't know. Um, if it's felting, like just really getting all harsh and looking like felted 
strings, then you need to not agitate so much. And then you need to avoid um, temperature swings between really cold and really hot um, water and things like that. Um, Amy, if I could go into my little silk mordant presentation and then we could finish up with questions. Do I have that or um, is that something? You have the matter and the logwood swatches, but I just wanted to talk a little bit on, um, cause it's already 10 of 10. Yeah, you're, you're, you're doing it. Questions. There's only like three questions left. And again, okay. these are all on our, our website too. But I did the silk and I wanna show you the silk. All right. <laughs> Kathy, did you say I'm going to show the silk? You have them, yeah. Those okay. are the ones you showed when before you brought up the um, oh, with the scour. Okay. yeah. Okay, great. Yeah. So um, my uh, my experiment was with silk, and I used a, a silk shantung, a silk broadcloth, which was tussa colored, and then also a silk um, uh, raw silk or a silk noil. And I have both. Okay, so here is my logwood experiment. Um, to your left is from bottom to top is silk noil, silk shang tongue, and silk broadcloth. That is um, a logwood with an alum with no mordant. And as you can see, it was just crazy wild. It actually even looked blue in the dye bath. I was kind of like freaking out. Um, but it, as just as, as Carrie showed you, there's absolutely um, very little color. And it's not even as dark as what the, the image shows. It's quite a bit um, more faded and it's wildly uneven. Uh, I think you can see it on the silk noil. It's just crazy bad. Um, on the left is, uh, from the bottom is the silk noil that was mordanted, the silk shantung above it that was mordanted. And of course the silk, the tussa silk that was mordanted. And you can see that they are um, much richer, much more even. Um, interesting. If, if you're looking for gray, there's lots easier ways to get it than doing this process. So that was my logwood um, experiment. And again, I'm using about uh, a quarter teaspoon of logwood in this dye bath. The next also really um, dramatic is the matter. And so on the left, the silk noil is uh, silk shantung and this the Tessa silk, they are all kind of beigey gold. They're actually kind of yellowish. And um, one of the things I was observing, because I haven't really done this much, is that matter has over 40 different dye constituents in it. And so with no mordant, there's obviously some tannins of some type and maybe even some um, which are giving you sort of a brownish tone and then even some of the yellow dye that you'll see in leaves and other um, plant substances which is coloring it on on the unmordanted side but obviously when you add a mordant in you get the beautiful bloom of the traditional matter color which is a brilliant orangey red uh, and so again the the silk noil on the bottom um, the Shantung in the middle and the Tessa on top. I just think it's it's really pretty. Um, again, if you're looking for a golden brown shade, there's a lot of ways to get it that are um, more efficient than trying to just not mordant in um, waste your matter extract. Okay, um, let's see. Okay, I think that's pretty much all I have to talk about in terms of unmordanted why you should mordant. I mean, if I haven't like beaten that into your head by now, okay, I'll accept that. <laughs> <laughs> but um, what we're going to talk about next is just q and A. I've, it sounds like we have a few more left and then Amy's going to open up chat if there are additional yeah. questions. Hopefully, I, hopefully people can stay on. Maybe it's a little, little longer than usual today by like 10, 15 minutes or so, but right. Uh, we can just keep going. We're well, going to keep going. All right. right. So okay. we're going to go into calcium carbonate and wheat bran questions. Yes. So after removing fibers from a calcium carbonate bath, the direction is the directions on our site say to rinse lightly. Should yes. one feel the chalk on the fiber or not? You should not feel the chalk on the fiber. If there's chalk on the fiber, rinse it some more. All right. Look at you. Speedy, speedy over there. Uh, Opinionated, one... <laughs> I think is the word. <laughs> 
If one is morded, mordanting, why is that such a hard word for me? Forever will be. If one is mordanting to die in the future, should one rinse completely post wheat and or chalk bath prior yes. to drying and storage? Yes. Yes, great. Yes, you want to rinse everything off um, because it's, it is chemically bonded in there. Um, so yeah, you don't need wheat pieces on your stored fibers. Okay. What is the best way to dispose of a calcium carbonate bath? So calcium carbonate is slightly um, basic or alkaline. And so you could just add a small amount of vinegar, like maybe a teaspoon, a tablespoon, depending on how, how huge this bath is. Um, and if you, if you are like an obsessive pH um, measurer, like I am, you know, you just want it to go back down to neutral, but a little bit of vinegar will definitely make it um, neutral or slightly acidic. And then you can just dispose of it uh, pretty much either in your, you know, down the drain, or you could even put it like in a garden because calcium is good for the soil. If you are up here, we have very acidic soil. So um, calcium is, is needed in our soils. All right, last question. Do you have a good source for quality remnant cloth, silk, 100% cotton wool to use as swatches for testing and or wool? Um, you know, I typically will buy things from where everybody else buys them, which is Dharma. Dharma Trading Company has blanks galore. Uh, they're very reasonably priced. Um, there are, I'm sure, all sorts of platforms where people are either getting rid of their stash or have, you know, raw fleeces or yarn spun yarns or mill spun yarns for sale uh, i bet one of our viewers knows what these sources are i don't use them so um i don't have a source for wool wool yarn specifically other than what i purchase um, new which is from jagger i buy from jagger if god willing they're still in business after this crisis um, Kathy, lots of questions already. I just opened the chat up. Yeah. Um, so let's see. Laura says, I've seen some instructions for scouring cellulose that say to just use soda ash. I'm wondering what the cellulose scour adds to the process. Um, cellulose scour help, helps set up the, the fiber to accept the mordant and the dye better. However, if you don't have it, yes, a soda ash scour for cellulose is great. So don't let it hold you back that you don't have cellulose scour. If you're just like, you really want to do some work, just go for it. You're, you'll, you will be fine. It will okay. be fine. Uh, Kate Ellis, when is it important to use a tannin as part of the mordant process on cell, cellulose fibers? So we have a, um, uh, a tan. So what it is, is you immerse your fiber in a tannin bath, cold, for a period of time. Then you move it to an aluminum sulfate bath that you've made slightly more neutral with soda ash. And we have that recipe both in our blog as well as in our blog. I think it's in our blog mm -hmm. is where it is. So we go through so much aluminum acetate, uh, both online and in our studio that there are times when we run out and because of current shipping, it, it's been a little uneven. So we've actually just opened up this other type of recipe. But I tell you, it's really great for light fastness if you have the time. Because it's, it's two very long processes. It takes about two hours and 15 minutes to get all the way through it. But once you're through it, you have a really great um, textile ready for pretty good performance. We use this on an upholstery project that I was working on. And uh, it made all the difference in the world. We were able to pass all the light fast and wash fast um, uh, parameters by using this instead of aluminum acetate. Um, so Kathy, there's like 23 messages. Um, okay, we won't get to all questions. of them. So, and it's one o'clock. So I just want to like um, be, you know, get mindful of people. Aware, mindful of Let's that. take um, two more. And then what okay. we can do is the rest of the questions, we can save the chat and um, I can just, we can just add them to this list of questions that okay. we already have and yep. then reload that up into the site. Okay. 
All right. Hi, Alexandra. Um, can you please go over the ideal temperature ranges for scouring and mordanting of various fiber types? I feel like I see conflicting information about which fiber is best mordanted at lower or higher temperatures. Okay, so aluminum acetate is, a, is what I call a cold mordant process, but what I mean by cold is that it doesn't get to simmer or boiling because aluminum acetate solution, when it's heated very hot, starts to um, precipitate, meaning it forms all these particles. So you don't want to, I mean, you use boiling water to dissolve it, but that's like a, you know, a 30 minute process. And then at that point you put it into cold water or even we say hot water, it, it's like tap water, tap water hot, right? Bath water hot. It's not, you don't put it on a heat source and boil it. Um, aluminum sulfate, the only reason that you, uh, would heat it in a wool bath is because wool has scales that don't open to accept the mordant, um, accept it at a higher temperature. However, to confuse you even more, it is possible to mordant wool cold. You just have to do it for a much longer period to allow that mordant to get into the fiber that would naturally just open if you had, um, or bloom, it would naturally bloom if you had uh, heat applied to it. Okay, so let's see. Holly's asking, can you please explain the scouring process? You said we have to do it, but didn't say exactly how. Okay, so we have an entire scour, how to scour um, on how to on our website. It's its own little section. But what I said about having to or not having to is if you have gray goods, if you have grayish raw materials, I highly recommend you scour because there's all that stuff that you saw in the beaker that's coming out of the fabric and it's going to impede the take up of both mordant and dye and you won't be happy with the end results. Um, if you have PFD product or if you have vintage goods that you are um, upcycling, you can probably get by with just washing them um, before you do that. And so before you start the, the mordant and dye process. But um, if you don't have that, if you have raw greasy wool, if you have gray goods, grayish goods, then you do need to scour. And the, did I answer that question? You did, you did. Right. I'm just trying to, there's a lot of questions I feel like you have answered or we have on the site, but um, so let's see. To clarify, for cotton, linen, and silk, can we scour and mordant, dry, and store the fabrics? Yes. You may. Okay. All of them, even wool. Okay, here's something we, that you haven't talked about. Can you talk about the safety measures needed when using iron? Yes. Okay, so I'm like iron paranoid, um, so forgive me. But basically, iron is um, a, cons a constituent of our own blood. And so therefore, our blood and uh, all the, you know, our lungs, everything is like we love iron. We want iron. We attract iron. And so as an adult, you know, who weighs at least 75 to, you know, upwards pounds, you have enough um, body mass that if you were to accidentally get a little bit of iron in the air and smell it or even get near iron or spill iron, there's no problem. But if you have, you know, pets that are little or children, iron is not something that you want to be using with them because their bodies are too small to absorb any um, residual iron if you're careless with iron. Now, if you're careful with iron, this is just overkill from me, but it just, it is toxic. That's why if you have ever had anemia and had to take iron pills, there's warnings all over those iron pill packages to keep them away from children because it looks like candy and kids don't know. Same thing if you're doing iron mordantine. This is something you don't wanna do um, with, your, with children around you can absolutely do it safely. Is there residual iron in your fabric is the next question I get. And so my feeling is that if you're doing any type of work um, for children's clothing where you feel the need to use iron, then you should have your, um, you should have your stuff 
professionally tested to see if you have residual iron in your um, on your fabric because I can't tell you how to wash it in order I can't tell you how you're mordantine if you're doing it correctly and I can't tell you how you're washing if you're also doing that we did it in a commercial laundry where we were using a lot of iron to get dark grays and blacks and we had it tested and there was no residual but this was again a commercial um, business so at home I, I don't have any way to instruct you any more than that I don't think iron uh, ferrous sulfate powder is what I am talking about specifically that that is something that um, you just want to be careful of, around children and of course for yourself you want to wear gloves it's staining you want to wear a mask you have one already uh, and then the other thing is that you want to clean everything afterwards because it contaminates um, everywhere and so we're just really careful with iron as you can see I don't use a lot if you look at my work uh, it's just not something that's that interesting to me but um, I know a lot of people love it and we sell a ton of it so just be aware and I know that the iron instructions online have all of these same things that I've just said in terms of being safe around iron and whether or not you use it around um, uh, young children and uh, your pets um, Kathy, do you want to just kind of, maybe that's the last one that... Yeah, and then you guys, for everything else that you put all, in chat, yeah. we yep. can definitely um, take the, the questions that we haven't answered or point you to the resource um, to your questions, and then those will be online as well. Um, so, yeah, thank you very, very much, everyone. Uh, this is just me to, yeah. amazing. And, and I also, um, yeah, I will have in that email later, too, that I'm going to send out to everybody the link to the answers to these questions. And Kathy, you and I will go through the ones that are, are currently in this chat and we'll, like you just said, we'll add them. But is it okay if I kind of plug for next week what we're doing? Absolutely, please. Okay, so next week is a little different, a little, it's exciting. We have um, the Baltimore Dye Initiative, Natural Dye Initiative will be joining us, which houses the Maryland Institute College of Art, which is uh, MICA. So they have artists and designers and they're, they're exploring the cultural and economic impacts of growing, processing and using natural dyes in the greater Baltimore area. And we're gonna be focusing on one of their projects, which is an indigo shade map, which is, we're gonna help them launch that. Developed by Rosa Chang, who's uh, somebody we've been talking with a lot and a group of MICA students that maps locations, histories and cultures of indigo plants all over the world. So. It'll be really cool. There's lots of great conversations we know that will come up out of it. So I already have it up on our site for RSVPing so you can learn more. There's links so you can click on learning about the uh, Baltimore Natural Dye Initiative and the Maryland Institute College of Art. So check them out. And uh, there'll be about four people, more, more of a presentation next week than, than uh, this, but we'll, we'll definitely have questions for them too. Yeah, it's a fantastic um, project that Rose is working on. She's an artist in residence for um, this particular institute and she's done amazing work. So we're really thrilled to have her and the entire team uh, present next week. And yeah. before you guys uh, move on, Kathy, do you wanna share those two books that were just super Oh helpful? yeah. So um, thank you for reminding me. So when we talk about mordanted and unmordanted, if you have either ordered or have access to Sasha Durer's new book, uh, Natural Palettes, every single one of the swatches in here, oops, not there, like in the, on these pages, one of these is the unmordanted um, version of this color. So you can immediately see like what's unmordanted, what does mordanted look like, what does um, alum with iron look like, and what does iron alone look like. I think that this is just fascinating to see. Just 500 swatches in here, so you could be looking at this and thinking about things forever. Um, the other thing I just wanted to say is for mordant information that I find super useful, um, both of these books, The Modern Natural Dyer and The Art and Science of Natural Dyes. What I like about Christine's book is that she uh, is our customer. 
and she has used our dyes. So a lot of the techniques and the dyes and the results she gets are consistent with the dyes that we have because she's our customer. With this, with this book by Catherine Ellis and Joy Botroop, and we will have um, links to both of these um, books. This is uh, fairly technical, but they give you the why stuff is happening. Um, and yeah, it's really good. It's, it is a deep dive though. So if you're trying to just kind of wrap your head around things, this is a good one to, to start with. And if you're, you know, pretty much uh, an accomplished dyer and you haven't purchased this book yet, um, it's something that you would really want to think about. It's, it's an excellent book. Okay. Anything else, Amy? Uh, no, I'll just open it up. Thanks, so Kathy, for the speed goodbye. round of Feedback Friday. Yeah, thank you, everyone. I can't it believe was... you didn't have any water that entire hour. What? Water? <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> All thanks, right. Harry. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, I'll unmute everybody. So, hey, we can, look, unmute. We can all unmuted. say hi. I'm going to go to gallery view so I can say, ah, look at everybody. Fantastic. Hi. Brady Bunch. Look at everybody. Hi, Grace. Hi, Sherry. Hi, Sarah. Hi, Celeste. Thank you. Hi. Hi, guys. Hi, oh, so great to see you. <laughs> Hello. Nice oh, backdrop. <laughs> uh, Diane. Thank you, guys. Thank Hi, you. Emma. Bye. Bye. Hi, Bree. Thank you. Hi, guys. Hi, guys. Oh, this is like a deli. I know. It's like I'm on some trip. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. Look at it. Wow. All right, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Little baby boys are cute. <laughs> All right.